Yo, what is up? You have found We Like the Blazers. I am your host, Ryan Witty Whitledge, and joining me, as always, from the other side of the world in sunny New Zealand is Brandon Goldner. Brandon, how are you doing today? In the year 2000! It is great <laughs> over here! I am one day ahead. I am three hours behind. It is sunny. It is hot. It is summer. There's a cat behind me. She's meowing. I have avoided sunburn. We just had friends over. We were doing adventures, and now I'm relaxing. I took a nap today, but my brain can't wrap itself around this trade deadline, Ryan. You have sun. I have snow. That's how that's. (laughs) Is it snowing? Yes, it is snowing right now. Wait, seriously? Yes, seriously. Wait, wait, what? When you say snow, what do you mean when you say snow? They are expecting an overnight flurry of snow to stick tonight that will dissipate by uh, mid morning. That sounds about right. Floor. So <laughs> that sounds about the, right. The typical snow. <laughs> that's still that's pretty cool. I mean, the fact that it sticks. I like snow. I I, I do. I I'm a I'm a snow guy. Can't get away I'm, from it. I'm technically you can. You have ran halfway across the world away from it. Yeah, I mean, it does snow here in the winter, sort of, kind of. It doesn't snow a ton. Actually, when Cassie first got here, it did snow her second day here. And it was weird because it snowed like six inches, but then it like melted by midday. So I, I don't know. Anyway, so there's a little bit. of We'll, we'll see when, when winter comes, when you have your summer, the roles will be reversed, Ryan. Don't worry. Like you are now on the way up and I'm very much on the way right on the way down as are our Portland Trailblazers. But we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm so mad, yeah. dude. I'm just so pissed off. Oh, uh, see, I, I was I was pissed off, but the the, the NBA trade deadline in general was just it, it honestly went a lot like not just for the Blazers, but for everybody. It went a lot smoother than I thought it would, because when the first news came down that, what? you know, that Kyrie was demand going to demand his trade. And I don't know why I put that to the Cavs, but uh, I just noticed that uh, when Kyrie oh, demanded his trade. <laughs> when he demanded Ryan his editing trade. his notes mid podcast, that would have been pretty funny though if he had gone back to the Cavs, <laughs> you know. And then everyone's like, "Okay, well now, now, now the waiting game begins because this is the big domino to drop." And it's like two days later, he's a, he's a Maverick. We're like, "Oh, okay, well now everyone's gonna hold their breath and wait to see what KD does." The day before the final day of the trade deadline, at like one o'clock in the morning, KD's to the Suns. It's like, oh, okay. So all these big dominoes are now out of the way. Everybody can just do their stuff. So I I thought that it went generally smooth. Uh, it was tough. That's as shit, interesting actually. that you use that word to describe it. Why? Because it was like one of the most active trade deadlines in recent memory, and for one that people thought was going to be pretty quiet. So I mean, smooth. I mean. Do you mean smooth as in like the big trades happened early? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, because that's always how how these trade deadlines work is that when you get these star players or whatnot, it's just kind of everybody is is in this holding pattern to figure out for one, if they can get any of these big names or for two, you know, no, none of your trades now, or none of your possible trade partners want to do anything because they want to see how the rest of this shakes out. So when it finally, that's fair. It, deals don't actually come down to happening in the final spot on deadline day. Like these conversations have been going on for a while, but when although, these kind of things, although when these if oh. one certain team had done their deal, not right at the deadline of deadline day, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Kermit <laughs> sipping tea. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, so uh, those things were out of the way and then everybody else was just free to do business as usual. And yeah, it w- and I kind of think that's maybe pl- why it played into having such an active deadline and seeing so many trades in this record number. And uh, my one complaint is can teams just get back to doing the single trades? Do we need to make everything a three, four, five, six team trade? Like trades that had no business all being lumped together. Suddenly it's like, oh, these four team deals. Just because somebody decided to trade a second round pick to somebody else for no reason. Second round picks are in fact the lubrication of the NBA body, Ryan. I think they're the new crypto. Invest now. I do think you are onto something. If you do get (laughs) Jesus, if I I can't even, my brain can't, can't, it cannot right now. I, but yeah, I do think there's something too. if you get the big deals out of the way, it makes the NBA landscape clearer for teams to then go ahead and feel comfortable making trades. Um, I have to say this was probably the most acute that I've ever felt 
the absence of Twitter in my life. Because as you know, I've logged off of Twitter. I've mm-hmm. logged into the Discord. Uh, go check out the Trailcasters Discord from which Ryan got banned for not being able to remember his password. Uh, his password being sexy butt 6969, uh, just so everyone knows uh, that. Um, X, 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 don't, X, X. Gotta, get the, gotta get the capital letters in there somewhere, boss. And it honestly, like how, let me ask you this. How did you experience the NBA tread deadline? I, I know that you are among the productive people in society who actually have a job. And <laughs> so I don't know, like, what were you doing? Like, were you following on Twitter? Were you getting texts from people? Like, how did you experience as all this stuff was happening? Well, for me, uh, you would think that while my current active job site is down on the Nike World Headquarters campus, that it would be filled with nothing but the world's best cell phone reception and top-notch Wi-Fi. It is a black hole of death. You get nothing in there. And seeing as that the Wi-Fi has yet to be turned on in the building that we are currently doing, uh, uh, cell service is limited to if you can find one of four windows on each floor where you actually get two bars. So I get very little, but that also just happened to be an extremely busy day at work for me. So I logged on at about, let's see, start my day before, before I left for work. So I was, I was reading up to all the early trades and and going. So so Ryan wakes up at two 30 AM, uh, three 30 to get it right. And before I (laughs) scrolling through before I left at five, just getting last minute caught up. I didn't check again until about eight 30 when I went to go sit down in a meeting and I was like, Oh, okay. And then my head almost exploded when I went to lunch at 11 or 1130 and, and had to catch up on everything that happened before then. And I was like, I don't even know anymore. Because, you know, so-and-so yeah. went here, but it's tied with here. And this is also my complaint about why does everything have to be a four-team trade? I don't know where anybody fucking came from. You can see in my notes, I just, I kept it as simple as possible. I don't know if we actually got Kevin Knox from the Pistons. Did he come from the Pistons? Was he on the Pistons before? I don't know, but the trade log says that he came from the Pistons. Sfee, Sfee, who I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. He was somewhere in there and we shipped him off. God, God bless fee, but fuck if I know where that came from. But yeah, so that, that was how I experienced it was just a, a, a long pauses and then attempting to catch up as quick as humanly possible. Kevin Knox indeed came from Detroit and went to golden state for salary matching purposes And then via a tweet from Woj, Knox is not a lock to remain with the Warriors, sources say. And it was not a lock because, yeah, he got routed to the Blazers. No, it's confusing. And, like, I I, I honestly don't know enough about NBA, you know, um, mechanics to understand why some of these three to four team deals were necessary. Like, for example, I know we're going to get to it, but, like, that trade in particular – I am. I, I don't even know whether like all of those teams needed to be involved. Like I, and like you could, could the Blazers have been cut out of that altogether and could the other teams have done what they needed to do without involving uh, Atlanta and the Blazers? I don't actually know, but at any rate, like it's, it's weird. It is confusing. It does make for some very like difficult trying to make sense of it all, particularly the value of second round picks which again, I think we're going to talk about at some point, but I did my best. Um, Mm -hmm. It was, I thought like when you kept saying smooth, I didn't find that that, I didn't find it to be smooth. I thought it was like exciting. And uh, like, I, I was glued to my phone trying to understand what was happening and when, and particularly in the days leading up to it um, after the Kyrie Irving thing happened. And then actually, let me get your take on this. Like, what did you make of what the Lakers were able to do, because I have a very gut wrenching take about this. It's the Lakers. I don't understand why every other team in the league is willing to constantly help them out of their mess. Right? Like, can we not collectively get together as 29 other organizations and say, can we stop letting these assholes back themselves into a fucking corner, make an absolute mess of themselves And then they come to us and they're like, you know, I can you just just this last time. We just need a we just need a hand. 
and we go, oh, okay, what do you need? And uh, magic. You're unburdened from the burden of the horrible West, Russell Westbrook contract. He goes to the Jazz, probably going to get bought out. I don't think he's been bought out already. Uh, probably would have crossed, but probably going to get bought out. D'Angelo Russell has circled his way back to the Lakers. Currently playing all right tonight, but uh, yeah, I just can we stop helping the Lakers? Stop it! I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised by anything they're able to do, but I don't necessarily think it's through like them being geniuses. I think it's just people get lulled into helping them for some fucking reason. Regardless of the reason why, that was a really good trade for them. I I'm with you. I have no idea how they were able to get off of Russell Westbrook's contract. Plus get D'Angelo Russell, which, you know, he has his flaws, but he's playable Malik Beasley. And then Jared Vanderbilt, who is on one of the most favorable contracts in the NBA, given his production and all it cost them was one first round pick like that, that, that kind of value had a certain team in the Pacific Northwest gotten similar value for the assets that they had, I would be singing a much different tune, Ryan. Like I just, yeah. I'm, I, I am with you. Like I, I was baffled that that went through the way it did. And I'm like, I, I had to step back and give Rob Palinka my polite round of applause, because honestly, that was a really nice piece of work. It was. And the one thing though, is, I mean, now the jazz, uh, I it, Danny Ainge doing his thing, just hoarding all draft picks known to mankind. So I think like the next thousand first round draft picks are held between the jazz and the, uh, the thunder, but you know, Danny Ainge keeps grifting. That's the other person that I don't understand why anybody still does business with him in the league. Like every trade well, you make with him is going to be favorable to him. To, and I mean, you're going to think, fair, that you're gonna think that you got a good deal out of it. And then you're going to look back like three months later and go, fuck, I got fleeced. To, to be fair, I, I it's not that hard to just sell your useful players and get picks in return. Like, I don't think that's the difficult part of, of GMing. I think it's a lot more difficult to like combine players and other assets like picks and cash to get better players, more favorable contracts, younger players, which unfortunately is precisely the position that Joe Crone and the Blazers find themselves in. Now I keep going back to the Blazers. I can't help it. Um, what else it's fine. did you we'll get there? Well, are what you else? Know, yeah, this one kind of ties into the Blazers because they were linked to OG. But are are you at all shocked that nobody bought on Toronto's asking price for OG or Pascal? I think you know sure. they 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 were looking for like three ones and a young up and coming player. I'm not surprised that no one bit. I'm surprised that Masai held his ground because he has multiple people this off season who he's either going to have to pay or let walk for nothing. Fred Van Fleet and uh, Gary Trent. So I, mm-hmm. I don't quite understand what Masai is doing. It doesn't like the thing that was interesting to me at a macro level was the market correction from the Rudy Gobert trade, because you could argue that Rudy Gobert got more in return than Kevin Durant did. You could argue yeah. that and for I, the number of, and picks, I think I mean, that's now, when Masai set his set his price. He's like, if that's what Rudy's going for, this is what I can get for these guys. And the NBA went running the other direction as fast as it possibly could, which I find very funny because I actually do wonder, like, I wonder if Rudy Gobert looking the way he does in Minnesota, which is not super great. Uh-uh. I do wonder if the way that he is playing specifically set some of the rules for this trade deadline. I do wonder that because, because if he had looked a lot better then maybe the value of those first round picks would still be as low as they were when they yeah. traded for him. But like, obviously every team saw that and went, Ooh, we want to keep our first round picks. But what about second round picks? And then you <laughs> saw what, like 40 second round picks flying around. So yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what Toronto's doing. I like, I, I mean, I, I, th- I think Masai just played a game of chicken that he thought somebody was eventually going to blink first on. And, and he ended up laying an egg. Wah, 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 wah. And so, yeah, it'll be <laughs> extremely curious, you know, for one it's, you know, granted the Blazers wouldn't have had the assets for his asking price, but I, how I'm curious to see what, what then Toronto's own market correction is on how they try to sell any of these guys off or trade any of these guys off come, you know, draft time or, you know, next season. So, I mean, but, it, it gives them, 
it, it gives Toronto less wiggle room now. Like again, like if you are either going to like overpay those two guards or they walk for nothing, like neither of those are a super great situation to be in, which kind mm-hmm. of puts the pressure on that organization to then get more for what they do trade weirdly enough. Like, so I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've never been a GM Ryan and I do think that there's what? something <laughs> you just I, play one on a podcast. I just play one on a podcast. It's it's easy just to sit here with no accountability whatsoever. But anyway, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure uh, what Toronto's medium term plan is. So, I mean, good luck to them. I mean, they got their title, you know, so maybe that's all that matters. And for the next 10 years, I don't know. Well, speaking of organizations that we're not entirely sure what their long-term plan is, uh, the Blazers move. Oh boy, here we go. On this trade deadline. Oh so boy. they kick things off. Uh, oh, I'm, oh. Yes. If you're listening to us, you've listened to 97 other Blazers podcasts and you probably can memorize or list off all these moves, but we're going to do it still folks. So suck it. Uh, I know I've listened to them. <laughs> the Blazers Every sent, last one uh, of them. <laughs> they sent Josh Hart to the Knicks for Cam Reddish. A 2023 first round pick generated a $7 million trade exception and also got the best humanly possible blazer of all time. And can you pronounce his last name? Fuck. No, I can't, but I don't care. It's your fucking clone. I have teased you about this man for years. I think it's Archie Diacono. I think that's how you do it. That is how you pronounce it. He looks like me. Ryan, people were making fun of me on Twitter that he looked like me, which sucks because I'm not even on Twitter. I went to Discord and Keith had copy pasted this tweet from someone. Someone had originally said Ryan Archie Diacono, if I'm even pronounced that right, looks like a finance bro, which is not a compliment. It's like this guy looks like a douche, which he kind of, you know, whatever, like douchey looking white dude. And then someone mm-hmm. else said, bro, that's Goldner. And then everyone <laughs> laughed. And I it's love like, it. And I'm I looking st- at it and I'm like, I kind of does. I started this like three years ago where I think the first tweet that I ever threw out there was a picture of you and a picture of him. And I said, have they ever been in the same room at the same time? (laughs) It's and, and you know what, to be honest, like I, it, it, these specific Twitter users didn't mean it as a compliment. I know that, but look, there are worse things than to be compared to an NBA player who is like fit and in their prime. Like, honestly, <laughs> like for a second, I was kind of sad, like, Oh, that's not very nice of them. And I was like, you know what? Actually, this is great. Like, Hey, I'll yeah. take it. Yeah. I say it lovingly. Also, I think you need I know to you take do. this. A, I think you need to take this a step further and you need to get his Jersey and submit that for the where in the world. Oh my God. I totally <laughs> should. That would actually that be is, amazing. That is how we come full circle is it's going to be you and his Jersey. And again, we're going to say, have they ever been in the same room together? The problem is I don't think you're going to be able to get his Jersey without ordering it custom. Cause I don't think anyone is going to be making money on Ryan Archie Diacono Jersey sales. I just don't see it, but maybe that's fine. Collectively. We know enough people. We may be able to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, let's. Anyways. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, can we? Yeah, let's re, re. I'll give it back to you. Reset. What the hell did the Blazers do? It, it sounds like you're going individual. So you're going to start the micro. Yes. That's fine. OK, do your thing. Yes, I am. So they started off sending Josh Hart. That's fine. We all knew Josh Hart was going to move. And God bless anybody who thought Josh Hart was going to bring back Kevin Durant. Um, I, I, I got a I got a bridge to sell you if that's what you thought. But, you know, he had a player option. He was going to opt out. Blazers weren't going to pay him. Just see what you can get. That's where I kind of think that, OK, Kind of cool that you ended up getting a first round pick out of the deal. I didn't think they would, you know, when, when it started going down that way and seeing is that it's in a very immediate pick too. It, it's useful. Um, again, yeah. generated a $7 million trade exception. Uh, those I think are equal to second round picks at this point. But uh, um, the next move that the Blazers made is they acquired Matisse Thibel from the 76ers, much to the hate and chagrin of everybody on blazers twitter i don't think i've collectively seen people lose their minds as much as uh as during that move what did they pay for matisse title uh, i think two second round picks yeah two so second here come round the picks. second round picks again this is a theme and by the way matisse Thibel tonight he's already i think he's like four of six from three so my theory, because by the way, we're recording oh, this during playing. the Lakers yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. My theory right now, uh, they're up 93-72 right now. 
uh, two minutes left in the third Let's quarter. Go. But, but Matisse Thibel is like four or six or something like that from three. And he's just been hitting corner threes. So my theory, he was an offensive sieve that couldn't play in the playoffs because he was an offensive liability because the 76ers were just putting him in the wrong corner. If they would have put they, him in the other corner, they would have been solid. We had the we had the Cam Reddish first game bump, and now we're getting the Matisse Thibel. Is it Thibel or Thibel? I don't know. Anyway, Thibel. Um, we're getting the Matisse first game bump. He yeah th- through the third quarter, he has fourteen six two assists, one steal, three blocks. <laughs> So, okay. Oh, he blocked a three pointer in the first quarter. That was nice. But the benefit That's here great. is that we've been screaming about defense, and this is the very first time that Dame has ever stepped foot on the NBA floor uh, at all um, in his Blazers tenure with an All NBA player or <laughs> All NBA defensive is leading player. The Blazers in minutes right now. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, wait, no. Dame has one more minute than him. Still, it's this is I, I nothing could be sweeter than the first game. He like everyone's like, whoa, my God. Anyway, so yeah. hey, Blazers Twitter has one thing that they're good at, and it is overreacting to the first game of a new player. So that's why I never the, overreact anymore. I'm build the statue, hang the banner. Let's go. But anyway, so again, he is a absolute defensive specialist. The Blazers need defense. Can't fault that, especially when it's not going to cost you any future assets, depending on how you feel about second round picks. Uh, then uh, let's see. The Blazers sent Gary Payton to the Warriors for five second round picks and the rerouting of Kevin Knox and uh, ended up generating an $8 million trade exception and freed up their uh, full MLE as of next year, because now it's no longer tied to Gary's contract. Um, And don't (laughs) worry, we'll come back to Gary Payton becoming a warrior. Uh, Sadly, they waived Greg Brown, the third. So moment of silence for him. But yeah, we're back for, for you. What is this signal for the rest of the season? Like, uh, have they punted? I mean, they're obviously they're not going to tank mode anymore, but like, where are you? Are you happy? Are you pissed? Are you like, I want championship and I want it now. Um, no, uh, I, I'm all right. Not. You heard it here first folks. Brandon Goldner does not want a trailblazers championship. Like not right bad. now is in right this moment. So I, I, I have a I I have I have been looking forward to this moment, Ryan, for the last three days or so because I had the hottest of hot takes. I had a script written out. I was ready just to have lava flowing out of my eyeballs. And as I've sat with it on your live journal, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> as I've sat with it, and maybe it's because I did take a nap today. By the way, I want I want a trophy. I I can't remember the last time I took a thirty minute nap where I fell asleep, woke up to the alarm and then felt refreshed. Like that honestly deserves a trophy right there. But like, oh, while I do feel I'm, refreshed, I feel calm. I'm pro nap. I normally take about an hour long one when I get home every day. Good nap. That's no, that's good. Well, you're in, you're, you're in nap shape. I'm not in nap shape. That's not naps are not <laughs> a usual part of my routine. So I, let me, let me start here. And I hate to do this cause you just went through it, but I want to do this really clean before I start screaming and, and you can Go interject ahead. anytime. Let's just really quick, like, what did the Blazers lose and what did they gain at this trade deadline? Okay, they lost Josh Hart, they lost uh, Gary Payton the second, and they quote unquote lost Greg Brown the third. What they got back was a net of three second round picks. Remember, because two of them went out to get Matisse Thibel, who they did get, Cam Reddish, who they got, Ryan Archidiakono, who they got a protected first round pick. That's probably going to convey probably be around 20. If the Knicks make the playoffs Uh, and that's what they got, Ryan. So my, my, before I spit lava, I'm going to turn the question back to you. Did, and and this is not the end all question, but it's a good starter. Mm -hmm. Are the blazers right now on the court better or worse now that the trade deadline has passed. Well, until I saw uh blazers legend, Matisse Leibel on the court tonight, uh, I was going to say, you can't worse, take a sample I, size of one and extrapolate all the way out. <laughs> fuck you. Yes, I can. <laughs> no, you cannot. It's not allowed. He will, for, he will forever be great. Are uh, they better no, or are they worse? Did they get better? Or did they get worse? Uh, worse. Hands down. Worse. Okay. 
So, so, so here's where I start then. And, and again, and I encourage you to interrupt me and don't let me go on for too long. Cause I have a habit of doing that. Right. Everyone knows this about me. Um, at one point I'm going to get up and just walk away and you're still just going <laughs> to that's, that's honestly, and I love you mom, but that's what, sometimes when I call my mom, I will just, it's on speaker and she's going and it doesn't matter <laughs> if I'm there or not. It, I'm sorry. Like it's again, I, yeah, you can see where I get it from, but so here's the problem with this. Yeah, they got worse. They got slightly worse, but they got worse. Okay. Well, well, Damian Lillard is 32. Damian Lillard's having arguably the best season of his career. Even with offense doing what it's doing in the NBA, he may still be having his best season of his career. And the Blazers got slightly worse. So you would think, Ryan, you would think that we'd all trust Papa Joe Cronin when he saunters up to the mic oh, with a smooth, you. bald head of his and his luxurious beard that is Whoa. every man flannel. Yeah, Start go, taking yeah, shit. Hold on. Start taking shots at bearded bald men in <laughs> flannel. I'm going to have issues. At least your flannel is on your ass and not where everyone can see it up top. I He wants to look casual. I get it. I get it, man. It's cool. Like it's so anyway, but he's sitting up there like, yeah, well, you know, we really wanted to make a big move. Oh, but you know, we couldn't do it. So what we did was we set ourselves up for the summer. Well, did you, Joe, did you set yourself up for the summer, Joe? Because let's take a look at what we have to work with. Now the Blazers most valuable trade assets were and remain Anthony Simons and Shaden Sharp point blank period. If you're not trading Dame, which if we trust Papa Joe Cronin, they're not trading Dame and they're not even taking calls about Dame. If you call it out, Dame, they're going to hang up in your face because they don't even want to hear it. So the Blazers most valuable trade assets remain the two players who are already on their team. The Blazers most promising young players remain the players who were already on their team and Shaden Sharp and Nas Little. And yes, I know Matisse Thibel's going off this one game. It's a sample size of one. Ignore it. So then what do they have to show for all of this? They have a protected first round pick, a protected Hmm. first round pick, one that's probably going to be number 20. That's, you know, okay, fine, but that's not super valuable. And then they have a net of three second round picks to show for all of this. What have second round picks gotten anybody ever? So I, I look, I'm hyperventilating. Well, this trade deadline, everything ever. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, let's, let's go through this, Ryan. Let's I I have done the homework. I have my, okay. First of all, if you have four second round picks, you can get Gary Payton the second. Gary Payton the second. He's a great player. He's injured. There's a whole drama thing with that. We're going to talk about it later. But like he was out for the most of this year. He hasn't looked quite himself. And that's the kind of player you can get with four second round picks. Okay, you know what else you can get for three second round picks? You can get off of three bad contracts. The Pacers acquired three bad contracts, including Serge Ibaka and George Hill. And guess what they got for? They got three, three second round picks to, to get rid of those contracts. Well, what else can you do? Three second round picks can facilitate another team's trade, the Westbrook trade. That was facilitated with three second round picks. Uh, okay, okay, fine. For for two second round picks, you can make that part of a package with a first round pick to get Jakob Pertle. Okay, uh, okay, Jakob Pertle's really gonna be a game changer. Okay, fine. You can use multiple second round picks to facilitate a trade like Eric Gordon, who's an aging star, $20 million left on his contract. It's non-guaranteed next year. So that's what those picks can get you. And then last and not least, four picks, four second round picks and taking on a bad contract can get you Josh Richardson. Who's a decent wing who averages like 11 points a game. That's probably the closest in any of this crap that I can see where four second round picks does absolutely fucking anything for you. So my, so my question to you and to the the dear listeners, and I'm clearly not upset about this at all. No, it doesn't name, show one bit. Can you name a trade in the history of the NBA in the history of the national basketball association where the difference in getting a team from mediocrity to greatness was second round picks. I can, I can't I can name a possible, I can name a possibility of one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which can one? A, uh, can a uh, second round picks by a uh, heavily protected first round pick. Maybe. So like, look, but like, here's the problem. 
The problem with the Blazers deadline, and I would love your opinion and think you you're, I really did want you to interrupt me. It's I kept waiting for you to like jump in and you were, you just love it. You like pulled the string and just sat back. I, I did. And I was watching to see if Dame got to 40 and he did. So, Oh, that's, I, I do like this uh, kind of live streaming of the Blazers game. I do. Hey, I love seeing them stomp the Lakers. The Blazers are currently up by 22 in the fourth quarter. Let's go. I, you, you love to see it. You do. So yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, LeBron's hung over from going to the Super Bowl last night. I don't blame him, man. It, what, whatever. LeBron has done a lot of good stuff and congratulations for him breaking all time scoring record. Didn't talk about it. Good stuff. But so I got to congratulate I, him in person. So my question to you, <laughs> shut up. He came up, my, back, he came up, he came up to his building up at the Nike campus the day after with Phil. So he could put his cute little box and the ball up there and ended up walking past him and saying, congrats King. So you should have said, uh, yo, do you, <laughs> can I work for you? I, I have to keep chef. this very simple when he's near Phil Knight and he's got I, his, and he's walking into his building. Uh, you, you have good discretion when it comes to that stuff. So <laughs> here's my, qu- my question to you. So I've gone on my tirade, you know how I feel about it, but we both agree the blazers during this trade deadline got slightly worse. And what Joe Cronin is selling us is that that's okay because it allows us to get better later. My contention with the homework I did and my personal opinions, which matter more than any amount of facts, but my contention is that what they did during the deadline does little to nothing to help them get any better. And that the, the trade assets that they have on their team, which would help them actually get an impact player that could benefit. We're already there and remain there. So what is your opinion about this trade deadline? I'm, I'm curious to know, and I will, I'll fade back. So uh, I am willing to eat all the porridge that uh, Papa Joe has made for me. I'm just, <laughs> if you're going into this, if you're going into this Papa Joe thing, I'm going, I'm going straight down that rabbit hole with you, but I'm no, surprised I, you can go to pizza. <laughs> oh yeah. There is Papa John's Papa, yeah, Papa John, Papa Joe. Anyway. But anyway, so yes, I was a little irritated, frustrated, but I guess it also still does boil down to what were your expectations coming in? Uh, I was, I went into this trade deadline, extremely worried that the Blazers would attempt to massively overpay for an OG Ananobi or as when he became available to try to overpay for a Yakum Pirtle. Um, but as it stands right now, like the things that they did make sense to me, like when I look at you know, you, you had a player like Josh Hart who they send out, he had a player option. Most people believe that he was going to turn down that player option, try to get a higher payday. Uh, all the players that they brought in now are on there. It's, it's a team control. You have restricted free agents. You have guys that are just up and, and done and out. Um, you did end up generating regardless if you end up using them or not. I mean, they still do hold value until they no longer do generating, you know, $15 million in, uh, in trade exceptions, grand total you by getting rid of Gary Payton. Um, I give the organization kudos for, you know, reasons that we'll talk about later, cutting bait on a player that wasn't working right off the bat, instead of trying to force it to make it work out of some weird fucked up false sense of pride that that we've had to deal with from a GM uh, uh, for the last previous nine years. But I see it. They have manageable contracts. They have cut their, cut their salary obligations, you know, say what you will about like, Oh yeah, a billionaire saved money. But it, 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 I'm, I'm happy that they didn't make a big dumb trade just because they felt that they should have. And I'll give Cronin credit for being able to step back and just say, okay, our swings aren't there right now. Like maybe they were trying to, maybe they were the other team that was holding out and, and waiting for uh, uh, Toronto to blink and Toronto never blinked. I I remember last trade deadline, we were all kind of somewhat pissed off, upset because Jeremy Grant didn't get traded. Well, but we saw the picture with Dame and Nurk and Grant, they were laughing. Like, how did this deal not get done? Well, there could be deals that have been talked about that couldn't get consummated at the trade deadline that may be able to get consummated in the off season. We don't know, but I, I feel confident and comfortable in giving Cronin until the, ball tips at the start of next season. That's like that. That's my time. Like when free agency is up like that, that's the extent that you get. I will give you one full calendar year. He'll have 18 months under his belt at that point in time to have remade it. But 
That's my deadline. I do I see a path hear, forward. I don't want to hear I, about I, you giving I, Cronin ball tips anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I I do see I do see the value, you know, uh in this, you know, you know, late teens, early twenties lottery pick, you know, if we were going to convey this pick that we're holding to the, or that we still owe the Chicago bulls, if we made the playoffs, it would be in that same range. Do they maybe want, or is there maybe a conversation to be had about, Hey, we'll just give you this next pick. So you know what it is. You can have it now. And you know, that, or our pick comes back to us. We'll call that good. Do you maybe want to attempt to buy out with those couple second round picks, buy out the bulls. Here's a couple extra second round picks. Uh, we'll go ahead and take our first round pick back, whatever, or, you know, in order for them to remove or have different kind of protections on it, whatever, because probably the biggest thing that hamstrung the blazers in this trade deadline is the, and what hamstrung them in the off season is the fact that old Shea fucked the team over by putting protections on this first round pick all the way out to 2028. That's fair. Like, so I hear what you're saying. I'm going to press you on it a little bit and you can tell me if I'm not getting this quite right. But I think what I hear you saying is that while not flashy, the Blazers made moves that make it easier for them to get better later. That's essentially what you're saying. Yes. I, I, okay. Maybe I don't have a question. I'll just blurt it out. I've thought about this and looked at this and, and I can't, I can't get myself to the place where I can truly believe that what they did during this trade deadline moves them meaningfully closer to that. I just don't like the fact that you have second round picks that have very little value, a first round pick that it sounds good. When you say first round pick, it sounds a lot worse when you say, you know, the 21st pick of the draft doesn't have a ton of value. There's a reason why players and like their average career in the NBA, like based on where they're picked drops pretty precipitously. Like I think after eight and nine, it really starts tanking. And like, by the time you get to the late first round and into the second round, like especially into the mid of the second round, it's like, you are really, you know, you're, it's a crap shoot it, beyond. It's a beyond a crap shoot at that point. You're probably not going to get value for them. So a lot of these picks the blazers had probably are going to have little to no value whatsoever. I can't get myself there because and and also looming over all of this, it's that Damian Lillard's getting older. If you say older. that Dame's old and dying, I'm going to drop you're kick you into the sun. You're wasting the best year of his entire career potentially. So do I, you think? My, but do you? So, does he look pissed off? Do you think he's not involved or was not made aware of? Hey, this didn't work. This is the direction we're going. I think he's fine with it, but that's fine for him. It's not fine for me as a fan who wants to see the team and him succeed. So, like, here here's my alternative. It's like okay. What I think Joe Cronin's trying to do is he's trying to have it both ways, which by the way, sounds like a bad Neil Olshay impression. I hate to say it. He basically did a Neil Olshay impression and then everybody clapped. That's what happened at this trade deadline, Ryan. And like, so I would prefer that the Blazers just fully admit, look, we're in on Dame right now. He's playing really, really well. He's got years left. We are going to mortgage the future to legitimately and practically maximize the last few years he has playing at this level rather than force him to play with a group of people who are, you know, some of the people who are going to be starting the second half of the season are like not NBA starting level players, probably, Mm -hmm. which is a bummer. So like, well, uh, another thing for me is if you look at the, if you look at the names and the players that were moved out of, out of, all of them. Like, would you have wanted Kyrie Irving to come and play along Dame alongside Dame? No. Okay. Uh, we all would have wanted KD to come and play alongside Dame. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't do it. I I can see that they, they could not have done that. Uh, let me, let me see. Uh, let's just go, you know, Russell Westbrook, another big name. Is, is he moving the needle? Do we want him? D'Angelo Russell is, is he getting there? Malcolm Pirtle. These are all the hot, big names that were actually moved this year. And we can go down the list of them and say none of them would have brought the Blazers any closer to a championship than they're sitting right now, having them on the you roster. Know, you know what would have gotten them closer? We talked about it earlier. It's OG and Anobi. And I think very strongly suspect that when Joe Cronin, I mean, he said a couple things during his press conference, and I have the quotes here. Where did it go? Uh, well, I lost him, but he essentially, he, a said that we're building around Damon Ant, which I, I mean, 
Yeah. Whether you believe that or not, I don't, he can't, you know, he I can't think say, Ant's movable. I, I, I think yeah, he can't say anything say, different. He's saying all the right things, but I think in his mind, if, if it takes one of Ant or Sharp to move a needle on a big trade, I think the trigger's pulled in a heartbeat. Right. So my strong suspicion based on, you know, there were some deals that were close, but the price is too high. And the fact that he said about Ant and Dame, you know, as much as Masai was probably overvaluing his players, I think Cronin's overvaluing Ant. I think there probably was a construction of Ant for OG somewhere on the table, somewhere in there. And he declined that, which is his prerogative. But if that were the case, that would be a move that gets you closer. Ant is younger than OG. He's on a good contract. And like, I get that OG plays a, I think I, I don't want to sound like a dumb dumb right now. Uh, and my keyboard is all sideways, so I can't easily pull that up. He is, yeah. So Ant's younger than him. And like, I get that OG, you know, the fact that he is a wing, like an actual legitimately sized wing, he plays a position of need and therefore you're going to play, you're going to pay a bit of a premium for that. Like I get it. Like, cause number to number Ant is a better player than OG and an OB, mm-hmm. but he fits Damian Lillard infinitely better. So why not do that? Like, like why not do that? And then, and also I would even go so far as to say like Shaden Sharp could be an incredible player, but I think everyone around the league thinks that he could be an incredible player too. And I'd be interested to see Mm -hmm. what he could get in return. So like, my point is this, like as a fan, as someone who wants to maximize Dame's prime, I don't think that the Blazers have the luxury of worrying about what are we going to be in five years? I think they have to worry about the next two and three years. I think that matters more. If you wanted that OG trade, I guarantee like granted Toronto was asking a lot, but it probably would have taken like an ant Keon and a first. And the crux of the matter is, is that the Blazers have their hands tied behind their back until the Chicago pick is dealt with and that there's no first to trade. So as much as we're, Technically, technically you could structure the protections such that it mirrors the Chicago pick. The problem is that teams find that really unattractive because you said it earlier. It's not predictable. You could, you could struct you because you're allowed to put, I don't think there's anything in the CBA that prevents you from protecting picks, which is why you see so many weird and bizarre protections Mm -hmm. and they flip into things. So you could do that, but you probably practically probably not because it's like too unpredictable. Like, I think that's really what it is. It, it it's it's such a minutia kind of thing that you can do that it basically it's just considered that you don't have a pick while you have protections that far out so fine yes because fine. nobody nobody's willing to do it but so so there's that um i uh, will agree to disagree on that a little bit like I, are you at least are i mean we're not getting the pitchforks out for Cronin yet or for you right sure the, no, but like Are you, this, at least, you seem like you're pitchfork shopping. Like you've been to Home Depot, yeah. you've you've walked down the aisle. <laughs> I'm definitely doing like a price check. Like I'm definitely <laughs> I, I'm showrooming it, which is where you go to an in person store and you check. Then you check the price online and what is it on Amazon and you know uh, w- whatever like New Zealand shop that like you want to say you could buy it from. No, but this definitely this trade deadline again. Like and, and I I it would be nice to feel better about this. And I've thought about it for a few days. I don't see how, what they did makes them better later. I think everything they did was so unbelievably marginal and Olshay esque that it doesn't actually, the, the, the second round picks are not going to be the difference in getting a player like that. It's going to be the people who are already on your team. And like, and, and look, I mean, there are a lot of arguments. You, there's no value. No one else would trade for players. They wouldn't have gotten anything back. I do think the Josh Hart trade in a vacuum was a good trade from an asset management perspective. And I, so I, that one in particular by itself, I can understand, but in totality, they didn't get any closer and they got worse this year when Dame is playing out of his mind. It's really, really, really hard. Like, yeah, I, I I think I think that is damning in and of itself, and I think it says that the Blazers are not all in on Dame. They're trying to have it both ways, and I think that's a problem. Well, speaking of damning things, uh, Jason Quick, your uh, favorite uh, Blazers beat writer of all time, uh, I have alluded... no real problem with Jason Quick. <laughs> nope, nope. You, uh, you he's guys a good aren't writer. Speaking terms. <laughs> You think he's a horrible writer and <laughs> I think no, he's, he, I think he's a great writer. He's a really, really good writer. I think some of his reporting, I don't agree with sometimes slash all the time. 
a yeah, lot of the well, time, he but he's a great writer. He ended up writing an absolute scathing review of all the Blazers deadline deals and, and everything that they are doing to waste Dame's prime. And, you know, in it, he kind of hinted at that, you know, players can't seem to wait to get out of Portland and they're so happy when they leave. And, you know, he, he followed yeah. that up the next, he followed that up the next day with, he does his weekly radio hits with Isaac and Souk on, on 1080 and, and he doubled down on it. And he's like, players are excited to get out of here. You know, look at, look at Rocco or, uh, uh, it, it was uh, Rocco and Powell last year. They were so excited to go down to the Clippers, you know, just this trade deadline. Uh, Larry Nance Jr. retweets uh, the the anniversary of him, him being traded and tag CJ and like, oh, what, what a great day, wasn't it? And then now, and which the last year's roster had its locker room issues. Like, what, it's but, long, sorry, it's what, 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 let me, I, I, I'm going to let you keep going. What does CJ have to complain about exactly? Well, yes, yeah, CJ did, didn't did he complain, go and, and become a way better player and get way more money? Bullshit. He had his best years in Portland. He got paid. Shut the fuck up, CJ. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think that that means anything. Sorry, just continue. Yeah, no, it's it's fine, and I don't think CJ replied, or I, maybe he did a little cheersy wine glass, but whatever. It's it is what it is. But the and it, and then, and it was good. It was good for Robert Covington. It was he did clash with Chauncey Billups. I think that's really all that means. And that's fine. Same with there's Powell. Nothing, I, nothing, I think and there's nothing wrong with that. That's and I do think that's the coach. And I think there's been reporting about that already. So anyway, I don't think it's a yeah, franchise and, problem. I think it's a Billups problem. But yeah. Yeah. And so then when Josh Hart, like, uh, he, this is where he lost me on it is, is he was like, and Josh Hart's just excited to be in New York. Well, for any NBA player, uh, being able to play nightly as your home arena as Madison square garden, like it's called the Mecca of basketball for a reason. And also his best friend from his college team and Jalen Brunson was back there. Like Jalen Brunson's reaction was going all sorts of viral because he freaking jumped up and down like a little schoolgirl when he found out that Hart was coming back. You know, you would have thought that he was just getting told that he gets to play with the ghost of a prime Michael Jordan with his reaction. So that's not necessarily a heart being like excited that he's out of Portland. That's just a, Oh fuck. I get to go play ball in New York and I get to do it with one of my best friends on the world. Great. So, um, but he kind of used that to allude to the fact and kind of play into people's fears about that. Jeremy Grant not signing his extension, uh, this locker room dysfunctionality, this this lack of control that Cronin's running a way looser ship than what Olshay did, which, by the way, I should point out that Olshay got fired for being an asshole for running too tight of a ship. But uh, that that's going to cause Grant to not want to re-sign with the Blazers. But you know, are are, are you getting any sort of vibes that it's just this team? This is a team in absolute disarray, and we're just chasing people out the door left and right. Absolutely not. By the way, this is why Jason Quick can be a shitty reporter. I just cracked open this bullshit story, which oh, I think you're is- scrolling through the Athletic. Uh, let me read what Jason Quick wrote. And Jason, I hope you're listening to this <clears throat> quote. If you pay close attention to the players who have left Portland in the last year, there has been an unabashed excitement upon getting traded, almost like a relief. Norman Powell and Robert Covington expressed their excitement when they arrived at the Clippers. Hart had an Instagram story of him singing after he was traded. Larry Nance Jr. this week celebrated the one-year anniversary of his and CJ McCollum's trade to New York by retweeting the team's post marketing the event. When you look, end quote, when you look at what Jason Quick used to support his line of there's been unabashed excitement, almost like relief, they are standard social media posts, standard from players when they go to a new team. There's Norman Powell excited to be coming home to Cali. Let's get it. L.A. Clippers hashtag understand the grind. Robert Covington, we here now. Time to get to work. Ryan, that's what players do when they're traded to a new team. They say, I'm happy to be on the new team. This is what Jason Quick is making the thesis of his work for The Athletic, which, by the way, The Athletic as an organization getting the reporting wrong on Gary Payton II, which we're going to talk about in a second, is pretty shoddy work. This, This is like, honestly, man, like. I could write a story like this and it would be just as legit. I, Oh, they said they're happy to be on a new team. That says nothing about the team's culture. That is that the fact that he went there is honestly very sad. And yeah, like I've disagreed with Jason quicks reporting in the past. And this is honest. This is a new low for him. This is pretty sad. 
he had one very regrettable thing that it made me cringe when I heard it. And it, cause I don't think there's anything here. Like I, I yes, I guarantee you that Cronin runs a completely different type of freaking ship than Olshay did. But again, I'm in a reference. Olshay was apparently a hard ass and that partly what led to him getting fired. But, um, he had made a comment that one of the things that apparently is, is rubbing a lot of players the wrong way is that, you know, the practice facility used to be a very buttoned up place. And so like, if you were going to come in and put in extra work or whatnot, it was like a scheduled thing and it was closed off and it wasn't family and kids and all that running around or not goofing off in there with your homies. And that's the exact quote that he gave, (laughs) you know, and he's like, but that's how it is under Cronin. Now it's just, it's all hoodlum. And I was like, Jason, please don't dive into the racial stereotypes of saying homies. Yo, and hoodlum. Yeah, I, I, I was, I, that's where he lost me on it. And I know that I knowing him. And again, I I've met him personally. I, I've, I've had encounters with him as a person. I guarantee you that wasn't his intention, but it's just kind of one of those regretful slip ups where I was like, ah, you lost me in the room on that point. Right. And, and look like this, this, the stuff about, you know, Joe Cronin, I mean, (laughs) to me from Jason quick specifically, which again, like him taking, I'm happy to be on a team tweets and, and, and trying to, to cut a yarn out of that, to say that the Portland organization is somehow crappy is again, I think it's pretty pathetic, but to me, this goes back to Jason quick. And and by the way, to his credit helped with some of the reporting when Neil Shea was eventually investigated and pushed out of the team, but for a pretty long time for about a year plus, I mean, I went back and I read Jason quick stories at the very end of Terry Stotts, tenure. And as someone who subscribed to the athletic, I often would ask questions about like, when are you going to write about Neil Shea's inability to put a team around Damian Lillard that can get him to win. And he kept Jason quick kept criticizing Terry Stotts, criticizing Terry Stotts notably absent was criticism of Neil Olshay until again, the, until the ball dropped that Neil Olshay was being investigated was the first in like the previous 18 months that I had seen Jason quick, write Anything vaguely negative about Neil Olshay, which says to me that perhaps he was tighter with Neil Olshay than he currently is with Joe Cronin. And the fact that he's willing to write an article like this about Portland's culture and to criticize when he said absolutely nothing at the end of Terry Stotts' tenure, when it was very clear that Newell Shea was a major part of the problem, if not the most important part of the problem. Again, it's like, it's petty and it's sad. I get that everyone approaches reporting a little bit differently. Everyone's got their sources. It's a tough Mm -hmm. balance to do. I don't have the talent to do what he does. I just don't, it's a hard job, but like, yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't him and and him and I don't take it seriously. Him and Dame are on rough terms ever since he he had wrote a piece, which I feel as though he was correct to write, but where it questioned like the Blazers should be taking trade calls for Damian Lillard to see what they could get for him. You know, and I mean, I I don't blame him for that specifically, but. Yeah, but apparently Dame took umbrage with it and since then has stopped speaking with him. So what kind of organizational backlash that ends up having down the road and what kind of reporting yeah. you can do, who knows. But It may surprise of, you to know that the NBA ecosystem is highly political. <laughs> so it's about relationships. Of, yeah. Oh, please. The Gary Payton drama. <laughs> yeah, how do you want to do this? <laughs> I don't know because I'm still not entirely sure we have everything, but... For, I think we have uh, as much as we're going to get. Can you, can you do a clean I recap? Can, I can do I can do a TLDR. So, uh, right. Uh, Friday night shams and uh, I, Anthony Slater, I believe is his name from, uh, down in the Bay come out with a report that or through the athletic that, uh, Gary Payton, uh, failed his physical and the giant four team trade was in jeopardy. Um, Buried in that article uh, was a comment that uh, said that he was told by Portland medical staff that he needed to tough it out and he was getting shot up with Toradol shots, which if anybody doesn't know, that is very prevalent pain reliever that uh, anytime you see an NFL player going to a blue tent, probably getting that. But uh, it, it's basically absolutely... it's basically ibuprofen. It, it acts in the exact same way. It's it's marginally stronger, but it's basically ibuprofen is what we're yes. talking about. Yes, but in in shot form, it can, it ends up 
wreaking havoc on your body, but it, it, it gives a lot more immediate pain relief. Um, but anyways, and so that was all stemming from his core injury and that, you know, the blade or that the warrior said that he could be out as much as three months, um, that sent the internet into a twizzy because, and, and the warriors, because everyone's thinking, Oh my God, they're going to cancel this. Wiseman's coming back, you know, Sadiq Bay's going back, you know, uh, we got to take Gary Payton back, uh, all this other crap. And then I want to say it was about like Saturday morning, you wake up and you find out that Gary Payton's agent, you know, Goodwin, who is also Dame's agent comes out and says, uh, the reporting is inaccurate. You know, my client were, uh, Gary Payton never got or never took a single Toradol shot the entire time he was with the Blazers. And now it comes down to like, all right, well, where's this? He shit never, he from? never got a Toradol shot to prepare him to play a game, by the way, but all of yes. these qualifiers do, yes. it seems like they don't matter, but anyway, yeah, sorry. So, so that all, all goes into it. Everyone's wondering what's going on. We originally think that the deadline for the Warriors to determine the validity of this trade or cancel the entire thing is Saturday. We find out it's Sunday. Um, but apparently the Warriors then also filed official stuff with the league and asked them to look at the Blazers and their malpractice and how they report medical information regarding traded players. Whoop de effing do. Uh, on Sunday, they decided that they were going to actually go ahead and consummate the trade. And when uh, the Warriors GM, who is it? Bob Myers? Myers? Who's I? My blanking on yes, his name right now. Um, he was given a. He was given his press conference, and he was basically asked like, "Hey, so what did you know about it?" <laughs> FYI, the player that was on your team last year, the last two times he sustained an injury of this type, uh, what did you know about it? And his answer basically came down to. Well, I just saw him play against us the night before. And so now, um, after consummating it, uh, uh, depending on the league's investigation of this trade, as well as the Warriors are pushing for them to investigate the Larry Nance trade from last year uh, from the Blazers, uh, the Warriors may be trying to seek additional compensation for their troubles. Brandon? Okay. Yes. It's a shit show, and uh, let's go. I have, I have opinions about this. So first of all, like the, I, I've been trying, I've been struggling to form a cogent opinion on this because I think I'm lacking some key information the, because the first thing that comes to mind is you explain all of that. And I don't, I, I can't, I, I don't think you mentioned this, but something that's important in addition to what you said. Oh, the correction. The, I left off the correction, which was that then sorry after gary payton's agent came out and said he was not getting toward all shots instead of retracting the story and putting out a new story they just snuck in a correction that said his agent disputes this and it was toward all pills good so he took them orally not anally that's a good distinction to make <laughs> so <laughs> so the first Jesus. no the first the first thing i actually thought and i'm not sure that you mentioned it is that According to reporting that the Blazers were not given a heads up about the Warriors concerns before the story hit and the story hit, which included a Warriors team source, not as the only source in the story, but as one of them, that story hit. 20 minutes before Joe Cronin gave his Blazers press conference. Right. So um, to me, the first thing I think of is, that's weird. The Warriors had an issue with this. They didn't tell the Blazers. They talked to the media right before Cronin does his press conference. To me, that screams done on purpose. Okay. So like, yep. so then I was like, why? Because yeah, like players fail physicals, trades are rescinded. That happens. Like, and to me, we were talking earlier, the NBA is a political ecosystem, right? And like relationships matter. Well, the relationship between two front offices matter too. And if I'm Joe Cronin, I'm like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. You couldn't, you couldn't have given me a heads up. Are you, are you serious? Like, and so that, that's the part to me about this entire thing that I'm really struggling to understand. I mean, I, I get that the Warriors want compensation. I get that they were not able to amend the trade because it was submitted right at the trade deadline. And by the time they did the physical, the trade deadline had passed, Hey, get your trades in earlier. This wouldn't happen. So I, I get that. But the fact that they didn't make a courtesy call to the Blazers to me is strange. And it suggests that the Warriors think that there is ill intent from, from Portland, which that to me, I don't understand that either. Can you, mm-hmm. 
can you, can you, I mean, does it make any sense to you that the Blazers would have been trying to hide this? It doesn't, was that doesn't make sense to me. The thing for me is what is there to hide? Gary What's Payton, hidden about it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He got Limited himself, minutes. he got himself <laughs> injured winning that your team, a ring the previous season, you didn't want to pay him. So he literally came here and in an introductory press conference or when I don't think it was his press conference, but when asked about why he decided to sign with Portland, he said, they gave me a crap ton of money. So, I mean, like he was just here for the bag, but like, then he, he sat out, like he was injured. There was recovery. We waited and he waited. had the surgery. He and had the surgery after he signed waited. the deal. By the way, just to just to throw that in there and like, look, I, I'm not trying to make Gary Payton a villain in this story necessarily because mm-hmm. like he hasn't said anything, but like he got the surgery after he signed that deal. Uh, OK, yeah. OK. So now if, it, if they're if the Warriors are thinking that somehow the Blazers mismanage his recovery and it, it, it and they hid that information and that's why he now has to get redone. I'm just going to personally say that. No, what no, are you going to say? I, it's not like anyone's right behind my screen with me and that everyone's just going to hear a dead audio. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just going to personally say, I'm not going to doubt the organization that has had their uh, star player for the last uh, 10 years uh, deal with this for a number of years and they know how to manage it and they know how to recover it and, and, and all that. <laughs> Did, didn't Nas but, Little also have the surgery? Like, yes. Didn't, like, Nas everyone had the surgery? <laughs> Uh, two out of three blazers this year have had this surgery and, and three, bl- three blazers have had this surgery and two out of yeah. the three well, of them. One of, one of them's having great. a career year an all NBA year. And one of them is having the best year of his career so far. And then the third one who Chauncey Billups said on the record about a month and a half ago has been dealing with injuries for many years has always played banged up talking about Gary Payton. That third guy hasn't recovered yet. And, yeah. and Bob Myers has the fucking audacity to sit there in front of a press conference and be like, well, uh, you know, I saw him play against our team. So, you know, and also, so like the other thing that's annoying about this is that you said it golden state asking the NBA. And I, I, I mean, okay, fine. If, if golden state wants some compensation, because they legitimately didn't know the guy was injured, that's I, I'm actually fine. With well, that. well, here's the thing here. I think before you get to the, uh, the, the thing about them asking for the new Orleans investigation, I think yeah, no. they have buyer's remorse because I think they knew he was injured. I think the blazers, like uh, how this stuff works is that it's all an online portal. So uh, whatever medical information that a team has literally in order for the other team's doctors to look at that stuff, it's literally, you got to click a button and give them access. So in order for that information to not be in there, the blazers would have had to purposely omit it. Which I just don't see that happening. So like, Correct. right. So but this strikes, this strikes me as a buyer's remorse in the type of like the blazers doctors were like, all right, no, he's, you know, he's playing it's manageable, whatever, you, you know, he, he had this hiccup. Maybe they could have been honest. And they're like, yeah, you know, it's, it's day-to-day minutes restriction, get down there. Difference of medical opinion happens with golden state staff. And they're like, no, he should probably sit out the next three months. And then golden state's like, wait, what? And this right. is all just coming from a difference of, of medical staff opinion. But now That's, golden I mean, state is now golden state is pissed and having buyer's remorse. That, that, this is the, this, so this is the thing that I don't, I'm still, I can't quite even talking with you. I'm, I'm even more confused. So golden state has like a legitimate reason to be like, Hey, we didn't know he was that hurt. Uh, that, that seems fair. But then Bob Myers has the gall to walk out there and be like, well, we didn't know, like he played against us and then has the gall to, to in their request to the NBA to investigate this circumstance. And you mentioned it. They also want the NBA to investigate the Larry Nance trade. Ryan, I did some Googling. You want to know what I found out slash remembered about that Larry Nance trade? Maybe, you know, it. he was injured at the time it happened and not playing and hadn't been for a while and didn't play for a while, but when he got back and you want to know what else was relevant about that too? New Orleans huh. waived the physical because they knew he was injured. So what the fuck are you talking about? Golden state? Like it's it. So I, and it's, it's actually triple frustrating now because whatever recompense happens in this situation will not be from the blazers to golden state. If the blazers get dinged, it will be from the blazers into the ether. They'll give up a second round pick perhaps, and mm-hmm. no one gets it. You don't get a golden state. So really you're just actually 
Th- this is why hey, I don't understand. Brandon, you're, you're, I figured out damaging. the value of those second round picks. They're there to pay your fines. <laughs> yeah, the, pretty much. Or they're there to wipe Jody Allen's ass with, I guess, if she runs out of toilet paper. That's pretty much the value they have. Anyway, but or like penguin bones. <laughs> yikes. But like, yeah, but like, but, but so that to me, Golden State, it seems like this was more than just. Uh, uh, they feel like it's more than just a misunderstanding. They feel like there's some, some animosity or, or some intent there. And that's why they went to the media and they didn't go to Joe Cronin. That's why they're asking him to investigate the Larry Nance thing, even though again, he was injured and the physicals waived in that circumstance. But like, yeah, none of this really makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, the trade has now been consummated and they got their guy and that's, that's totally fine. I, I will say as an aside, as a separate thing, that two, two points. One is, you know, if you're at the point that you need to be on a minutes restriction uh, and you're kind of missing games and, and like, maybe just, maybe just sit out. Like, even if you're cleared to play, maybe just don't play at all. Like, I don't know. Like it's not, I'm not a doctor, but it just, it seems like good practice to me. Like if I couldn't go hundred percent, I wouldn't be playing whatever. But the second part the, is the, the scuttlebutt behind the scenes is that there was a and you know, now I don't know if you can blame the organization, but players are players. They give, they give each other crap, but the scuttle up behind the scenes is that he was kind of getting a little bit of grief from guys on continuing to sit out, even though, especially after he was medically cleared, you know, player amongst player kind of razzing about like, yo dude, come on. You ever going to play this year? That kind of shit. So, well, I mean, it's, that sucks it's a valid because question, that's like, but yeah. So there, there could have been some of that. Am I going to blame the organization quote unquote for that? No, uh, guys, players tend to be assholes sometimes, you know, they, they, right. they, <laughs> if, if they view themselves as wanting to play through it. But my, my question, I, I real, my question real quick to you. So regardless of the warriors intentions on that, how do you feel about the reporting then on this? And is, cause I kind of get the sense that the athletic has taken one to the freaking taint for this. I mean, the reporting was not accurate, right. About the Toradol shots. And then mm-hmm. also the reporting did not include anyone from the blazers. And again, like maybe you can forgive in the rush of trying to get it out first, like, you know, Sham Sharania and, and some other warriors reporters had it first. And then Adrian Wojnarowski has like the exact same story the next day. So maybe they without knew crediting that, them. Right. Woj, which, uh, Woj never credits his champs. They, 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 according to Mike Richmond, the lockdown podcast, they don't like each other anymore, which is totally fine. But, um, and so they don't credit each other, but like, but, but you could say not only is the reporting, it was technically inaccurate. You could also say maybe do your diligence and check sources on the Blazers side as well. Like why wasn't Jason quick a part of this story? Right. Like Mm -hmm. maybe they couldn't, I mean, I think that the story would have been slightly better had it just said like, we didn't receive comment. Like we tried to reach out and didn't get comment for the story from the blazer side of it. But like, so yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the, I, I'm not, I don't think the reporting was stellar and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know how much we should really crap on the athletic for that. Like, you know, but maybe sure. Like I'm not super happy with it. Do you think the source in any way, shape or form was Gary himself? I doubt it. I think this is more like, and look, I have a conspiracy theory that I've been public about, and I'm not going to tell you what my sources are, but like, this strikes me a little bit like the Henry Abbott thing with Dame, right? Mm-hmm. Dame's going to demand a trade. So uh, by the way, okay. So Chris Haynes, who is a reporter now he's with Bleacher Report. He moved, he moved again. Um, nope. He's with and Turner. He's doubling. He's with Turner and someone else, right? Turner and Bleacher. Okay. So Chris Haynes was on. Uh, the podcast with Dia Miller a little, a while ago when she was still at Blazers edge. And he said, when I talk about sources, I have three different levels of source. The first is a team source. And when I say team source, it's usually the GM. And if it's not the GM, it's like two multiple staff in the front office who I know are bulletproof. So when I say team source, it's as close as you can get to the team. The second is a league source. And he's like, league sources are typically agents. They can be other players or it can be someone who has like a reliable track record with NBA um, knowledge. Okay. That's a, that's a league source. Then you have the third category source, just source. 
that could be me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not really, but like the, the, so when you look at the athletics reporting on this, they actually credit team source league source. And then for the tour draw injections source, which oh, so they suggests got, so they got the they got the ball boy, uh, the right. end of the bench, the end of the bench two way guy, and uh, and the uh, GM secretary. Correct. And, <laughs> and, and remember, Henry Abbott reported that Dame was going to ask for a trade, according to a source. Right. My conspiracy theory is that source happened to be someone very close to Dame, happened to be someone who was related to Dame. And so, like, his brother. (laughs) So, like, if you take someone who is in the heat of the moment pissed off because they're protective of their family member or their friend, and they don't, they get the fact wrong, right? Like in that mm-hmm. case, it was like, yeah, and, and blah, blah, blah. And Dame's going to demand a trade, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, that technically not accurate. Maybe Dame, I mean, it was clear Dame was Dude, feeling. Maybe Dame, yeah. Maybe Dame vented to him. He's like, motherfucker, I just need to ask out of here. Right. And then same thing with this, blah, 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 blah. They shot him up with Toradol and ketchup and cocaine and whatever. And then like, well, ketchup and cocaine, but Toradol is a real thing. Jesus. But like, but th- so like, it, you know, I, th- that's the, the, I made up the ketchup and cocaine part. Okay. But like, but the point yeah. being, <laughs> That one was a source. Never going camping I, with you. The same, the same way the second round picks are the lubrication of the NBA body. Sources are the lubrication of good reporting. So I value the the intricacies of good, you know, shoe leather reporting, which sometimes does necessitate anonymous sources. We learn things about systems we would not otherwise learn because people are afraid. So we it's not that I think that we should just every time you see source, don't believe it. I'm not saying that. Yeah. However, in this case, it was technically inaccurate and it caused a shit storm. And by the way, I find it very interesting. The two parties in this who've been dead silent, almost entirely dead silent. Uh, the Blazers organization have said virtually nothing. I mean, only when Joe was asked about it, Joe Cronin was asked about it. Did he give like a nothing answer? And well, because he Pitt- probably just learned about it 30 seconds before he cracked the right. freaking mic. Right, exactly. And Gary Payton hasn't said anything either. But the thing is like, the Blazers are not pumping their sources through to, you know, the reporters of the world to get their side of the story out. The Blazers have been silent, which you know what tells me? That reads to me as confidence. I think the Blazers yeah. know they did nothing wrong. I think that's, yeah, I think that's the they, fact. There's no desire for them to get out in front of damage control or anything like that. Correct. So, I no. think they, I think they I know, know damn well that they didn't do anything wrong. I honestly think that's what it is. Yeah. So, and for anybody who, uh, who I, I completely agree with your sources thing because, uh, also you and I, we have sources and that's scary that people trust us with information. And that's not necessarily sources. like we have went out and cultivated these sources. We have sources that just randomly found us. So t- it's take crazy how Damian Lillard will. will call me up and be like, yo, what's up? Yeah. I have some shit. To- no, just kidding. He doesn't do that. <laughs> uh, I, I babysit Nurk's cats. So that's how I get my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> God, wouldn't that be cool? He probably owns so, like tigers or something. Wait, can I say one more quick thing? Very fast. Absolutely not. So this been, no, go ahead. <laughs> Very fast. Uh, the NBA season is long. Players often play hurt. We know that, I mean, we've heard over and over again, right? That the NBA players, everyone is injured with something at some point of the year, correct? Mm -hmm. I bet you that aspirin and ibuprofen and Ben Gay and heat and ice and massage and Toradol are all part of like very common pain relieving, you know, pain management that that is very common among almost everybody. And I'd be very curious to know whether that's the truth or not. And whether Toradol specifically is something that has ever been called out in like a trade health thing, or if it's just assumed, Oh yeah, they're taking aspirin. They're getting this. Oh, he got an ice bath. Better report that. You know what I mean? Like where does the line end? So that, that was my last thought. One uh, one thing that I totally forgot, and I want to give kudos to him because it was, it kind of speaks to the validity of like what you were talking about with you know the the Blazers have confidence in this is that the after all of this stuff had come out you know Josh Hart he's playing his first game as a Nick and the uh, the PR person for the Knicks uh, literally goes to like you know cut cut press conference off or whatnot and Josh it literally like. Shun, shunts person away is like i just got to say this real quick just got to say this real quick and he sings the praises of the trailblazers organization of the front office of the medical team 
personnel doesn't call out what the situation is, but just basically says Portland is a class act organization and gives them all the highest props and that they do everything above board. And Josh Hart is a person who we know played through multiple stretches of this season with fricking turned ankles and we sprained know he was, ankles and hurt. all that. If anybody's getting any sort of under the radar, shady treatment, it would have been him and unprompted without question, on his own to step up for the organization, for the friends that he has in this organization, all that stuff and say they're class act. They do everything above board. It leads me to believe that. Yeah, this is for some, some weird fucking warriors hang up that they got and the blazers are in the right on it. So I call also that wonder if you will, but it well, is. And no, I think that's a really good point. I, I actually can't believe that. I forgot that too. And you mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to re I'm going to repeat, you know, Aaron Goodwin is GP 2s agent. He's also Dame's agent. I, I just, I can't speaking of politics and relationships. I cannot imagine how many bullets when that dude clicked on the athletic and saw what the article is about Aaron Goodwin was like, Oh shit. Like there's no, there's no doubt like that. That's like, so, mm. um, Anywho, yeah, I'm glad that this is over. The Blazers have their useless second round picks. The Warriors Everybody get tackles. their guy. So it's all the world is unicorns, rainbows, and strawberry cream. So good for everybody. All right, Brandon, take us out of here. If you ever want to reach out to us about Toradol, cocaine, ketchup, suppositories, you can always reach out to us at we like the blazers at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter at like, <laughs> at like the blazers. The suppositories have a little picture of Ryan's head on it. It's amazing. It's you can find a business him. card. I'm making a business card out of that. <laughs> You can find him at the witty Ryan. You can find me on the Trailcasters Discord. I am there. Actually, I will. I mean, I hate to do this, but if you're on Twitter and you and you go to at Goldner PDX, there's actually a link to the Discord where you can actually find me because I'm no longer on Twitter. But that's where you can find us. That's where you can find our show. I am Brandon. That is Ryan. These are the Blazers. They beat the Lakers. Let's go, Blazers. Batiste Steibel for MVP, Sixth Man of the Year, Most Improved Player, All NBA. Build the statue. Build the statue right now. But until next time, I appreciate you all. Yeah, and uh, that's 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 the line. It's the it's it's say it again. Go piss. Go Blazers. <laughs> this is the most <laughs> awkward ending in the history. Of- Go Blazers. Good job, guys. <laughs> okay, cut. <laughs> Bad Go landing. Blazers. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ! I'm leaving that all. You son of a bitch. <laughs> now you have to leave it. In. I'm leaving it in. I'm leaving it in. <laughs>